Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for coming. Yes. Director General Francis Gurry will present the World Intellectual Property Indicator for 2014. And um, we have also with us today our Chief Economist, Karsten Fink. Sir? Uh, uh, thank you, Samar. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. Thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Uh, Karsten is here, as uh, Samar has already said, and also Masaid Khan. Uh, who works under Carsten and is the head of our statistics area, uh, and they are responsible for this report. Uh, so a few messages, if I may, uh, about the report, which, if I may say, I think is a very good survey of what happened in the world in 2013 in intellectual property uh, filing terms. Uh, and so the first message, I think, is you know, the continuation of consistent growth of the IP system. Now, that's something that's not new, that uh, we've been speaking about for many years, but I think it's worth making that, uh, uh, repeating that message, because it is one of the indicators of the knowledge economy, if you like. It's one of the indicators that there is an increasingly important uh, component of knowledge in production and distribution uh, of goods and services. And that comes through very sharply uh, with the growth rates that we see in 2013, which very briefly were in the patent area in terms of filings an increase of 9%, you know, uh, to 2.57 million applications. In the uh, trademark area, an increase of 6.4%. These figures are available to you in the press release. Uh, in the design area, increased by 2.5%. So I suppose that's number one message. Number two message, I would say, is that a, a huge amount of this growth is driven by China. So again, not a new message, consistent with what we've been saying for a number of years now, but it becomes more and more pronounced, let's say, uh, the position and prominence of China in seeking intellectual property titles. So we see, for example, that it has the largest number of, of patent filings, trademark filings, and design filings uh, in the world. In each area, the Chinese office receives more applications than any other office in the world. So this is quite a significant thing. You can also say, because that's, that's all, the offer, all the applications that China receives, whether from Chinese residents, Chinese enterprises or nationals, or from foreigners, it's the largest. But it's also the largest in terms of resident filings. You know, what, what is being filed by Chinese, as opposed to what is being filed by American enterprises or residents or European, various uh, European, different European countries or Japan. So uh, this is extremely important. We also see largely as a consequence of China that Asia is occupying a terribly prominent position now. 58.4% uh, of world patent filings, 48.2% uh, of world trademark filings and nearly 70%, 69.4% of design filings worldwide. So uh, Asia more generally than China, but China in particular. Um, for the particular country performances, I'm not sure that I need to go into those because the details are given to you in the uh, press release, so it would be pretty boring for you if I were to take you through it individually. Uh, apart from the Chinese phenomenon, which I think is extremely important. Uh, uh, but to some extent, as we say in the report, what we see in the in intellectual property filing field is a mirror of what we're seeing in the world economy. Okay, so uh, you see that in the patent area, for example, uh, you have growth from China, significant growth, you know, 26%. Uh, you have growth from the United States of America, uh, but you have a fall from uh, Japan, 4% less, and for a fall, 0.4% less, from the European countries, uh, members of the European Patent uh, uh, Organization. 
Um, what else can I tell you that is uh, uh, more or less high level here? I suppose we can uh, say make a comment about the fields of technology, which have been most prominent. And the most prominent is uh, computer technology, 7.6% of all pat patent applications. For Switzerland, the most filings are pharmaceuticals. For France and Germany, transport-related technology. For Korea, UK, and the US, Republic of Korea, UK, and the US, uh, computer-related technologies uh, were the principal fields, the main, the most important field, let's say. Uh, in the trademark area, moving away from patents, and very briefly, uh, again, you know, you have the phenomenon of China uh, with uh, the fastest growth rate of the major offices, 13.8%. Uh, an extraordinary number. Uh, in the trademark area, we make our counts on the basis of uh, an application per class of goods or services. So one application might contain four classes. So the numbers are slightly inflated, but it's the only way we can get comparability across countries because there are different systems. So for China, it's uh, 1.88 million. You know, extraordinary numbers. Uh, and if you compare that to the US, it's 486,000. Uh, or the European Trademark Office, 324,000. Uh, the main sector, uh, or at least the, the most important sector, let's say, rather than main, agriculture for trademarks, 16.5%. Interesting. Um, followed by clothing and re and research and technology. And then just a word on industrial designs, I'd say, of course, again, uh, we, we do see a slowdown in China, but it's mainly because they have had so many in recent years, I would say, and there were such high growth rates. Uh, but we see a slightly different patent pattern, whereas in the case of patents, you get this, uh, let me say, domination of filings by uh, industrialized countries and China. Uh, in the case of trademarks, it's a bit more mixed. In the case of designs, uh, we see China as the predominant uh, uh, filer, of course, but also important uh, filings from a number of developing countries such as Turkey or Morocco or uh, Iran. Um, we have also reported on plant varieties, if I may just say one final word, on plant varieties. We may not have spoken too much about that in the past, but it's a very important area uh, which covers innovation in traditional breeding techniques in plant varieties. Uh, and it's a very interesting area also, and uh, a more attention is being paid to this area. Uh, we can see clearly uh, the numbers are entirely different. So worldwide, 15,000 applications, 15,200 but a growth rate of about 6.3%. Uh, and the largest user of the system is the Netherlands, which of course is a centre of uh, flower distribution for Europe uh, and also a very important breeding centre for ornamentals, but also uh, vegetables in particular. Gaston, some additional words? I don't think so. I think. You've summarised the main trends. Uh, you know, we, as you said, we could say a lot more about uh, the performance of individual countries or offices, uh, but I think you know this is all well documented uh, in the press release and in the tables in the report. Okay. Okay. Is there questions, Ravi? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. As regards China's figures, how credible are they? Because. Uh, one has just read in the economics about the so-called design patents and lucrative patents filed by China, and also the Chinese Communist Party's directive to file patent uh, application uh, without regard to whether they actually amount to any breakthrough or any innovation. So where do you place these figures, given what one has just read now <coughs> in the economics latest issue? Uh, then the second question is uh, where do you exactly what, what is happening in, in 
India. Mm. Well, let me take China, and then maybe, Carson, you can uh, respond to the India part. Uh, I wouldn't want to contradict an authority like The Economist, but I would uh, say that all the signs we see of China's engagement in this area are extremely positive, extremely strong. So strategically, of course, the country since the third plenum uh, is on a, a journey from made in China to created in China. Uh, you know, away from manufacturing towards the more knowledge intensive industries. And that uh, is a policy that is spread across the country, of course. Uh, so that's very significant. And intellectual property is, has an important role in that transition. Secondly, I think when you look at other indicators like investment in research and development, China is the second largest investor in absolute terms uh, in research and deve development uh, around the world after the US after, and before Japan. Uh, by 2019, trends, current trends would indicate that it will catch the US into absolute terms in R&D expenditure and will pass Europe as a whole in R&D terms. Enormous investment in education as well. Uh, and I don't think that these are insignificant indicators. I think they are indicators of, of uh, you know, the importance that China is attaching to this area and uh, the strength of their engagement in the area. Uh, you could also add other indicators like numbers of science and technology articles published, and that's, again, a very strong performance and increasingly strong performance. Then we come to our specific area of intellectual property. Well, the numbers, I think, say something, but they're quantitative measures and not qualitative measures. Well, we don't have agreed upon metrics for judging quality uh, across uh, applications. Uh, one uh, indicator that is used is the number of times a patent application is cited by other patent applications. And that's pretty positive for China. I mean, it's equal to Europe, but European. But says it's not the case. Hmm. Well, I haven't read upon his article, but, uh, you know. Most of the patents filed in China are all basically Chinese sort of given. When it goes to other markets and other countries. Well, well I have a look at a report done by t uh, Thomson Reuters within the last week, yeah. and which is available and which will give you some further it's information on this. Background. Is it? Okay. Yeah. It starts with the Thompson Reuters mm. quotation, yeah. Yeah. IQ, and yeah, then that's questions right. the validity mm. of this past practice. Yeah. Well, for the reasons that I gave, I would be uh, an optimist about the performance of China. India? Um, India. India. Or you, unless you want to add to China, yes, please. Well, maybe just one word on, mm -hmm. on China. I think, um, you know, it's still a relatively young intellectual property system. And um, I'm sure, you know, that's what many people do. They often point to individual, you know, patents or design patents, invention patents or design patents, and, uh, you know, use that as an example of something that's of relatively lo low quality. Which, by the way, is something you can probably do for most jurisdictions. You know, people regularly do this uh, for patents that have been filed uh, at, the, at the USPTO. But I think that doesn't tell you anything systemically. Um, now, I also have not read uh, the, the Economist's uh, story. Um, I'm sure there is learning going on on the part of the IP users in China, on the part of you know the the you know the the professionals you know who are behind the system, you know on the part of of the Chinese Patent Office. Uh, but I think there are clearly you know sort of encouraging signs, not in t not only in terms of you know the underlying R and D investments, uh, but. Uh, um, you know, also in terms of, you know, the way that uh, intellectual property is used, you know, for, for commercial purposes in the Chinese economies. It is correct, and our report documents that, that um, Chinese patent filings overseas are still far below what you would observe for the United States and Japan. Uh, in the case of China, they stand at around 30,000 uh, compared to more than 200,000 filings abroad for the United States and Japan. Now, again, I think 
you know, that speaks to the fact that, you know, the Chinese IP system is still relatively young. Certainly filings abroad have been growing very rapidly in the case of China. But one also shouldn't forget that, A, China is a very large market, so the necessity, you know, of Chinese companies to file abroad is certainly smaller than it is, you know, let's say in the case of a, you know, Swiss applicant. Uh, um, I think that's, uh, that's important uh, to, 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 to keep in mind. Um, uh, so, you know, I, I, I would share the Director, General, uh, Director General's optimistic outlook uh, on China. But I think it'll be interesting to how we look at this 20 years from now when, you know, I think, you know, history will be, will be written. On India, I can give you the 2013 uh, number. India saw a filing decline in the area of patents of 2.1%, of, of two, 2 a relatively minor decline. You know, this comes after many years of, of, of growth in India. Um, just to give you some numbers, in 2004, there were more than, you know, slightly more than 17,000 patent filings in India. In 2012, that figure rose to 44,000, 40, which is, you know, the highest on record. Uh, so you've seen a small decline in 2013. Uh, which maybe I'm speculating here related to the economic slowdown. You know, we know there's you know always uh, some correlation between um, you know economic performance uh, and 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 you know patent filing performance. Uh, um, that may be maybe one factor, but but uh, we ultimately don't know. But most of the patents have come from the non-resident Indians. Yes, I could look up the number, but it's still the case that the majority of, of patents so that in India... So doesn't quite speak about any sustained activity or growth or something to talk about? Well, it depends on what you would like to measure, I would say. Um, but certainly, I mean, we can give you the, the, the numbers on resident filings if that is what, uh, what you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but uh, ten and a half. And the growth on 2012. Okay. Yeah, uh, but it's not um, inconsequential that foreign filings exactly. are going up. I mean, there is a reason for that, and that uh, is related to investment and what is happening in the Indian economy. Also, you don't file there unless you also uh, uh, have a an interest in the economy, yeah. Thank you. I think there was a question here, then. Uh, yes, it is. Hi, yeah, sorry, I'm just from AFP. Um, just wondered if you could speak a bit more um, about the relationship between patent filings and the health of an economy. Is there a kind of chicken and egg thing? I mean, you talk about as the economy goes down, there are fewer, but is there also a, a kind of reverse uh, relationship there? And um, in terms of following on from what a gentleman was saying about uh, you know, is, is, does that change when we're talking about a higher percentage of resident or non-resident? Because I noticed that Australia has a large proportion of um, non-resident applications. Um, does, does that kind of speak to a certain change in the, the health of the economy um, as well? Well, as I mentioned, we know that there is a correlation between um, you know, the business cycle and, and patent filings. So, uh, you know, we saw this quite clearly in the course of the, of the great financial crisis in 2009, um, um, you know, after which in most jurisdictions there was a significant uh, drop in, in patent filings, and indeed you would find the numbers uh, in this report as well as the previous reports, uh, you know, that, uh, that uh, we published uh, on statistics. Uh, um, we also know that correlation isn't, isn't one for one. Um, there are many factors that influence patent filings from one year to the next. Uh, you would also um, often find that uh, research and development spending, even though it may be affected by the business cycle, you know, is, is less affected than you know, consumptions and other elements uh, of, 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 let's say, economic output. Uh, um, and, and often what you would observe is that, you know, patent filings, uh, you know, react A, more slowly and, you know, in a more muted way than, than the business cycle. But a lot depends really on, on the country and, you know, there are lots of confounding influences. Um, then, for example, so the declining share of European patent filings, is that a reflection of 
Europe's decline, you know, the economic situation, or is that a, a sign of basically Europe lagging behind in terms of innovation, in terms of other countries, well, other regions, of namely Asia? I would answer that with a qualified yes, uh, in a sense that Europe's declining share has partly to do with the fact that China is growing a lot. So, you know, if China is growing much faster than the rest of the world, it's only natural that the global shares of the other regions uh, decline. But it's also the case, and you know, you would find that in our numbers, that in Europe, uh, patent filings uh, have been have been more or less stagnant, uh, and. Um, you know, while you probably, you know, can't make a direct causal statement that, you know, this is entirely due to the financial crisis uh, and the ensuing, you know, weak economic performance, I think you can say that, uh, you know, there, there is a mirror in, in, in what you see. Um, the reason I would say qualified yes is that if you look at individual European countries, the performance is quite mixed. Uh, so you look at Spain, for example, you know, in Spain you saw healthy growth of both research and development uh, investments as well as patent filings really up to 2009. And you, know, you look at the data and you see that since 2009, you know, there has been stagnation, stagnation if not declines in, 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 in both variables. Uh, and I think there the relationship to the, to the crisis is fairly obvious. Uh, I think in some of the larger European economies, such as France and Germany, the picture is more nuanced in a sense that in France, you know, and also in Germany, there has been reasonably healthy um, growth in, in research and development, uh, but, you know, the, the patent piling, filing performance has been more mixed. Uh, and again, you know, there are, there are other factors uh, at, at play. You know, there are public investments in research and development that were undertaken in the aftermath uh, of, of the crisis. Uh, so, you know, there isn't any one-to-one -one correspondence, but I would say that, you know, certainly economic, e economic conditions leave their, their imprint on, on how, f um, you know, the economy uh, performs, performs in the area of innovation. Let me just add one comment, if I may, because you raised the resident, non-resident uh, question also, to say that to some extent this is, uh, can be a misleading sort of figure, because what you are measuring to a certain extent is one individual country's performance against the rest of the world. Mm. So most of, most countries have a larger share of non-resident applications, naturally, than resident applications. Of course, there's a scale, and it varies. I think the US hovers around about the 50-50 mark, for example. Uh, China is definitely more resident than non-resident for a whole host of reasons. Uh, Japan is probably more resident than, than non-resident also. Uh, but most other countries, you'll find Sweden, I think, might be the same. Even yeah. they have more non-resident. Non non OK, yeah. So, uh, so that's um, a measure to be treated with some care, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, Jamil then Boris. Sorry. Two questions. Um, first, uh, still on China. Um, some uh, multinationals and other companies claim for the last 10 years that they went to China, the products got copied, and now they're patenting these products, as, as uh, Ravi said. Um, is this uh, a lesson also for uh, Western companies? Uh, because many of them say that they went into uh, joint ventures with Chinese companies and other business deals, and now they're seeing their own products being uh, patented with some kind of... Uh, is this a lesson as well? And uh, secondly, uh, on Brazil, uh, despite the increase uh, overall in the world, to see the numbers of Brazil, they're very, very small. Um, and even if you see the patent office in Brazil with 30,000 uh, files, uh, 26,000 are from, uh, from abroad. So mm -hmm. basically the, the innovation aspect of the Brazilian economy seems to be not in a very good health. Uh, can you comment on that? Mm. Well, on the first, what we're measuring here is filings rather than <clears throat> uh, the extent of imitation that might exist in any particular economy. So. Uh, we have very little in the report that can address your question. Uh, and then I think, if I may say, that your question has a certain amount of anecdotal um, you know, value, uh, that this is what people are saying. Um, 
I think what I could say is that China takes intellectual property very seriously. And if you look at both strategically and in terms of providing an administrative and legislative infrastructure. So one of the uh, things that has just been introduced in China, for example, is specialised IP courts. Uh, and uh, uh, that will come online uh, in, on January 1 next year. Uh, and there are relatively few countries in the world that devote governmental infrastructure to the specialisation of enforcement of intellectual property or intellectual property disputes. So I think we see many signs that they're taking this extremely seriously uh, in China. Uh, look, with all of these, uh, cases, yeah, it, have a, have a huge so they have a separate office for patents and designs on the one hand and trademarks on the other hand. Uh, in the patent area, my guess, do you know, uh, Carlson, I think uh, we're around about 15,000. You know, it's a lot. It's the biggest in the world. It's the biggest in the world, yeah. It's, it's, it's uh, huge. Um, now, on Brazil... Well, that's a difficult question, I think. Carsten, do you want to make a comment on it? Um, yeah, well, I can't say too much about it. I think, again, I think the 2013 performance you have to see in light of how the Brazilian economy fared in 2013, which I think was the beginning of, of the downturn in Brazil. Um, and you're right in saying that most of the filings are by non-residents in Brazil, but that does affect resident as well as non-resident filings. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, um, that's important to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, now, um, the fact that the minority share of filings in Brazil are from, from, from residents, you know, is that a big problem per se? I, I don't think it is. Uh, I think, you know, there are pockets uh, of, of excellence in Brazil. You know, if you think of uh, the, um, the aircraft industry, if you think of Embraer, if you also think about oil exploration technology, where apparently, you know, there's, there's quite a bit uh, happening. But maybe I'm the one who's now using too much anecdotal evidence. Uh, agriculture? Um, you know, certainly agriculture. You know, Brazil is doing quite well in, in plant varieties. Um, um, so it's, it's, it's not that, you know, there's no innovation occurring in Brazil. I think it's the question of whether the glass is half empty or half full. Um, Boris and then John. Yes, first, I don't know what the, the Locano classes are. Yeah. But more broadly, without taking you too much time, um, patenting and technical creativity is one of the topics least uh, easy to put in numbers. And still, today is a publication of the indicator uh, report, so you have to co focus on numbers. But still, there are very few tables which can help those who are not interested in just the country, um, country-wise uh, breakdown, but the, the, let's say, technical uh, category breakdown. What do this, what are these patents about? Is it a new painting for tomatoes, or is it a new uh, underpaint, or uh, is it a uh, 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 solar um, uh, cell, I don't know, and there are some data, but I have bad hearing, including bad hearing, I, I don't think you have addressed that since the start of this. Uh... So, a couple of comments. One, we have available on our website uh, a data centre where you can go and profile your country very easily. I am not interested in my country at all. I am interested in, uh, in technological mm -hmm. innovation. Okay. Papers. Well, uh, first, you can you can do that. I thought you were interested in your country. It's the first part. And secondly, Mosey? Patent scope has all the information. And hmm? patent scope, yeah. Well, in the case of in uh, patents, I think the breakdown you would be interested in is the breakdown by fields of technology. Yeah. 
um, and that is available. That is in the report. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to point you to them. The Director General, in his opening remarks, referred to computer technology as having seen the fastest uh, growth in 2013. Uh, also, if you, you know, for example, in this leaflet here, um, uh, it's actually not here, it's, it's sorry, on pages, uh, on page six, you know, you would find uh, the fields of technology that, you know, have accounted for the fastest growth in patenting. Uh, and surprisingly, uh, medical technology are much more sluggish than more ancient fields of computer technology, it seems. So all this would be interesting to, yeah. right. to examine. Yeah, more in you're right, and there is, a bit, but there is a, we have a, this difficulty, that in the patent system, for the way in which they classify uh, patent applications, because they have to do it to examine against pre-existing technology, is by fields of technology. And in economics more generally, uh, people often use, for example, standard industry classification. So we have a, a difference of classification techniques. Now, uh, you know, this computer technology, is it used where? Is it used in computer goods or is it used in supporting innovations in different industrial applications and fields? Uh, and the same for biotechnology. It can be used in agriculture, it can be used in, in pharmaceuticals. It can be used in chemicals. It can be used across a whole range. So there is a slight difficulty, if you like, in trying to classify the whole field of patent applications. I know it's not very helpful, but just to explain uh, one of the methodological difficulties in this area. You did mention the Locarno yeah. system. That's just a method of classifying different industrial designs. Yeah. We have John and then Gunilla. Yes. Um, Gary, in your research, do you have an assessment of how many of the patent uh, applications come from dual-use areas, in other words, where there is a military and civilian input? Uh, for instance, we've seen recently in the Ebola vaccines, a lot of it comes from the Department of Defense uh, research through the National Institute of Health. <coughs> how much of this research, whether it's in uh, engineering, in, in the electronics, whatever, it's coming, from, and can you capture this in the statistics, at least what is uh, patented into, uh, say, the US Patent Office or the Chinese Patent Office? Uh, uh, we can't. Why? Uh, well, for a start, because a number of countries, such as the United States or the United Kingdom, uh, have a system of secret inventions. Okay? So uh, before, uh, for example, uh, for security reasons, the United States law requires a United States resident or enterprise to file first in the United States of America and not overseas. Uh, and incoming applications are uh, screened uh, and those with potential, uh, potentially significant military applications do not necessarily find themselves in, in uh, their way into the open patent system. Uh, and that, that uh, uh, United States is not the only country to practice that system. I believe that the United Kingdom and France also practice it, but I would need to, you know, put my research up to date. So that's one reason why we can't have an accurate measure of this. What we do know is, of course, that there are many commercial applications of what started as military technology, such as uh, GPS. Gunilla? Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about the, the Nordic countries. <laughs> and I see there's been declining applications in the EU, but it hasn't touched as much, if I understand right, in Nordic countries. And how do you explain that? Because after all, we also have the the economic recession. Mm. Well, I'll start and Carson can uh, finish or compliment or correct. Uh, but, well, the Nordic countries are all uh, knowledge intensive economies. Uh, and uh, they're all knowledge intensive economies. Uh, they're, with the exception of Norway, of course, not res resource, primary resource uh, economies. So what they have is uh, human resources and technology. 
Uh, so this has been a consistent trend for many years. So we see uh, extremely strong performances for Sweden, Denmark, uh, Finland uh, in these areas uh, and also in research and development. If I'm not mistaken, Sweden has the highest uh, GDP percentage of GDP committed to research and development in the world. Uh, if it's not the highest, it's one of the top uh, it's one of the highest. Um, and what else could I say uh, about the Nordic countries? Um, Karsten? Yeah. Well, I'm just looking at the number numbers, mm. and I'm obviously not, not prepared. Um, I, I would say, though, that if I look at uh, Finland, you have a decline uh, of about 5% in filings. Uh, in the case of Sweden, it's, a, it's an increase of about 2.4%, which is similar to you know, what you see in other European, or I would say is within the range of other European countries. Uh, you see a notable increase in Norway, and I can't tell you, you know, immediately what, uh, what uh, is behind uh, there, but certainly on the, on the face of the number, I would characterize that as a, as a more mixed performance. Um, and the Finnish would be standard, in any way? Because that's quite a lot. Yeah. Compared to Spain. Is that Nokia? I'm asking you, <laughs> because I know Nokia has been going through, you know, difficulties and uh, well, that may be reflected in patent filing, but I'm speculating here, so... Uh, yeah. And uh, remember also our Global Innovation Index, we have very strong performances from uh, the Nordic countries, I think Sweden is number three, if I'm not mistaken, on the Global GIA, yeah. two, two, yeah. Uh, but also strong performances from Denmark. They're all in the top ten. Yeah. Sweden, number three. Used to be two. Number three this year. Finland, number four. Uh, Denmark, number eight. Yeah, so strong performances there. Uh, there's more time. And, and My question is related with the report. So if you want to the yeah, then we can. Yeah, I could follow up. Uh, I could up earlier. Um, uh, with reference to the patent filings, you've also got a statistic in, in the report of uh, trademarks in force or patents in force. I think it's more trademarks in force. Both. Uh, what's the difference between the two? I mean, we, we are the countries where people just file and forget about it and pay the fee to make sure it's, it's relevant. And are uh, the countries where they're active doing better in terms of royalties, etc.? Well, on the first one, there's a fundamental difference between the patent system and the trademark system. Patents in most jurisdictions are limited to 20 years, whereas trademarks in principle can last forever provided uh, applicants renew them when, when they come due. Um, and you see that, I mean, what is interesting if you look at the age profile of trademarks in force, uh, you would see the majority of them of relatively recent vintage, uh, but there's a significant number of trademarks that have been enforced uh, literally for decades, and you know that speaks to the fact that you know certain brand names have have long-lasting lo long-lasting values. Uh, you know, if you look at the aggregate values of, of patents and trademarks in force, they're increasing simply because you know applications uh, have been increasing, and you know you would expect that uh, to result in an increase in, in the stock of existing trademarks. Um, yeah, but which are the countries where you've got them in force, and which are the countries where people just file because they say I've invented something or I've just got something and just pay the fee and don't activate it. I don't think that there are many people that file unless they have a corresponding economic interest or activity. So I don't think they file and just leave it there uh, because it costs money. So, uh, and there are maintenance fees. So you would, f if you file in a country, it's because you're interested in having an economic activity there. Mm. Um, this. Um, uh, in a huge, among a huge numbers in patent marks and designs, respectively, which kind of technologies on just receptive so most applications to break down the numbers? Well, uh, computers and telecommunications from memory uh, was the uh, predominant field. Uh, but we'll just consult it. 
Yeah, I think we would need to get back to you on this. I think the numbers are easy to, to dig out. You have them here. Okay. So the three top fields in the case of China is computer technology, digital communication, and electrical machinery, apparatus, energy. So these are the fields that you, know, you would associate with information and communication related technologies. Uh, um, having said this, I mean, these are the top uh, three fields. If you look at the spectrum of patent uh, filings, you would see China filing patents in, in pretty much you know, all of the technology fields. Uh, so certainly, you know, the fields of specialization differ from country to country. But I would say China's you know, patent, uh, patent filings are, are, are reasonably well diversified. Page 32 and chart A23. Boris? Yes, sorry, I, I stick to my type of question, not to embarrass you, but because after all, we are all here to try to understand what technical progress is above, beyond the figures, helpful things. For instance, page 33, I very well understand the uh, bars about medical technology. But if we look at the ones on basic material chemistry, we feel very embarrassed because we see that Brazil is the most innovative in terms of basic material chemistry mm -hmm. and that uh, Korea is the last but one. So we could conclude, okay, uh, Brazil is basic and not Korea. But if you, we look closer at the list, we are surprised that Brazil tops Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, etc., and Korea is on the other side. So it poses all the question, what really is basic and, and, and what is sophisticated? Another question is page 122. So I know that Procter & Gamble is not no longer just in the washing powder and pampas business, but still... A lot of patents in pampas. I mean... A lot. Patents, uh, pampas is their most heavily patented product. Yes, yes, but here in page 122, we are in the in the uh, uh, design. Right. Uh, so I, it's still surprising for me that Procter and Gamble find more application for design by far than Hermes, for instance, just behind Swatch and Philip. So all this, for me, poses very interesting questions of. Interpretation, and yeah. uh, I hope you will stay long enough with the years to come to gradually <laughs> clarify to us all this fascinating. Well, on the second one, you know, I think I'm I'm guessing an answer. <clears throat> on the second one, I think that you would find that Procter and Gamble have vastly numerically more products than Hermes. Vastly, I mean, they are all over the consumer uh, uh, durables, uh, 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 consumables. What does this mean for this kind of product? It yeah. has surely a meaning, otherwise they would not yeah. be here. But it would be interesting for us to understand what it means. Yeah. So I would say that's the second one. And on the basic chemicals, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, well, what is important to keep in mind for the figure a24, these are relative speciali specialization indices with the emphasis on relative. So you compare the strength of countries across the spectrum and figure out where is it that they have strength and, and weaknesses. But that does not necessarily allow a direct comparison between countries. Uh, so uh, it may very well be that overall, you know, Germany files far more pa many patents in, in, in basic mater materials chemicals than Brazil, but as far as their relative performance is concerned, you know, but so that's important to keep in mind. It shows that Brazil, it was page 33, yeah. that Brazil, together with Netherlands, yes. Germany, and Switzerland, is, a rather, is rather prone to innovation in basic material chemistry. Yeah. It's a strange group if you compare the, with all the figures on the, I mean, the charts on this page. So that was just a question. I, I know that you cannot supply an instant 
Mm. But I think the answer could be interesting in the yeah. sense that it, most likely it's interesting in a sense that, you know, this is all based on, you know, sort of data on patent filings and fields of technology. Okay, I think we'll take one last question. Um, Thank you. Uh, Francis, coming back to this uh, issue, the mention of the Chinese are getting serious about IP enforcement. But I think uh, some recent studies have shown that the threshold level where an infringement is a violation is much uh, lower in terms of uh, value, the higher. More products need to, uh, you know, you, it's a high level before a citizen who might have counterfeited X amount of products before it's a, it's a criminal offence. Is yeah. that changing with the new law? Well, or, or is it still this... Uh, well, there is a, an annual study done by the British law firm Rouse. R-O-U-S-E, on lit IP litigation, and uh, it comes to some interesting conclusions, uh, one of which is that uh, foreigners win more frequently in Chinese litigation than uh, uh, residents in IP field. Uh, and they substantiate that, and you can look at their study online. Uh, but, uh, well, there's many possible explanations for that. One may be that there are more foreigners that, are, uh, you know, uh, have uh, interesting, strong titles in force there, because you tend to file overseas with your strong titles. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's on, the fa on its face a very interesting statistic. Yes. So... I'm not sure about the, I think we have to be very careful about the story. My question is, are they lowering the threshold level? For instance, a few years ago, someone could infringe three or four hundred products mm. before it was considered a criminal offence. Is yeah. that getting tighter in the law? Is, is the law making an infringement uh, yeah. totally yeah. easier now than in the past? Well, I can't give you a direct answer because I'm not qualified to without looking at the data, but I would say that, uh, you know, they take it very seriously and indications of this study by the, a, a very credible annual study done by the British law firm are that uh, foreigners are not necessarily suffering in the Chinese litigation system at all. Well, thank you very much, and happy holidays to everybody, and hope to see you yes. in the new year. The red carpet will always be flowing in front of this.